Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Scrubbing the Skies, the webinar series of the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy at American University. I'm Will Burns, and I'm a founding co-director of the Institute. In November of last year, the European Commission published its proposed framework for carbon removal certification, and the proposal is now being discussed by the European Council and Parliament. One of the important components of the framework is the potential role for soil-based carbon sequestration approaches, one of the so-called nature-based solutions. Given the European Union's leading role on carbon removal certification, its treatment of this issue will likely be important not only for European climate policymaking, but may help to shape how we incorporate nature-based solutions into climate responses in other parts of the world uh, also. A new report contends that incorporation of soil carbon removals into the framework could prove problematic. And we're privileged to have two of the authors of that report with us today to discuss uh, their findings. Ann Siemens is a senior researcher on energy and climate for the Urker Institute for Applied uh, uh, Ecology. And Hugh McDonald is a fellow with the Ecologic Institute. Welcome to both of you, and uh, thank you for uh, joining us. We will begin with interventions by Hugh and Anna, and then move to a series of moderated questions. And finally, we'll field audience questions. So uh, please feel free to begin to populate the Q&A box as we proceed. And with that, uh, Hugh, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks very much, Will. Um... And thanks all uh, for joining. We're excited to have the opportunity to discuss uh, this work with you. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully, you can see my slides there on screen now. Great. Uh, OK, so yeah, so what we wanted to discuss today was this paper that we published uh, about a month ago. Um, and to do that, we're going to run through kind of four, four things. So the first is. Uh, we want to give you a little bit of context about the EU carbon removals policy and kind of climate policy in general here within the EU. We're going to jump into the specific policy that we're discussing today, the carbon removal certification framework, which is a proposal from the European Commission and provide some more details on that. And then we're going to focus more specifically on soil carbon removals and the challenges that they pose for certification. Um, So just to give a, a bit of context for our work, <clears throat> this um this this paper that we've published, this report that we've published is uh, the result of some collaboration between Eco Institute, which Anna is representing, and Ecologic Institute. Uh, Ecologic Institute is a, a think tank based in in Berlin, Germany, uh, focused on environmental policy issues. Uh, and this project here is for the German Environment Agency, Umwelt Bundesamt. It's a project called Nature-Based Solutions, Market-Based Instruments to Support Climate-Friendly Soil Management. Uh, and the paper that we're discussing today is just one of a series of papers that we are publishing as part of this project. The first one uh, had a look at what the global and European potentials of nature-based solutions were and dove uh, in a bit more detail into the definitions of that term, nature-based solutions. Um, we have a series of fact sheets and a paper discussing the specific climate actions that we're talking about when we're talking about climate friendly soil actions and how they can deliver climate mitigation. Uh, this paper we're discussing today has also been published and we have uh, two upcoming papers. The first one focused on challenges related to funding climate friendly soil management. We'll touch on a lot of those issues in today's presentation. And then a final one where we evaluate uh, 10 existing climate friendly soil management mechanisms, methodologies, uh, and make some conclusions about, about the, yeah, the challenges and the way forward uh, for those issues. So uh, let's jump now <clears throat> into the meat of the presentation. So first of all, some, some context. Uh, so here in the, the EU has signed up to the Paris Agreement with the subjective of, if possible, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. And to put that into action within the EU, uh, we have the EU climate law. Now, the climate law establishes a number of different targets and objectives, but the, the key one for our discussion today is that 
it aims for net zero greenhouse gases by 2050. So this um, climate law was put into law in 2021. Uh, so net zero greenhouse gases by 2050. What does this mean for carbon removals? Uh, it means two things. In the short term, we need an increase in carbon removals so that we can try to meet those Paris Agreement targets of 1.5 degrees. And in the medium and long term, <clears throat> we need ongoing removals with biogenic storage, so so-called nature-based solutions, and uh, particularly, you know, post 2040, 2050, we also need removals with storage and geological stores. <clears throat> we need those uh, medium and long-term removals so that we can achieve net zero. And if you look at this diagram here on the right, uh, you can see that kind of visually. So this here is uh, some scenarios developed for EU policy making, which show the decline in, you know, the current level of emissions and the decline in emissions that are going to be required to to meet our our policy objectives. And you can see that we're seeing shrinking emissions from all of the major sectors. Basically, what we I also want to bring your attention to at the bottom is the is the need for is the removals. So everything below the zero line is removals. So, so those in green are land use, land use change and forestry removals. So these kind of biogenic storage removals. And you can see that they uh, need to increase over the future, um, particularly from 2030 onwards, if we're going to meet our net zero targets. There's also growth in technical removals, these geologic storage removals. That's the red ones there. Um, and the expanded image on the right hand side shows two different potential scenarios. <clears throat> but what I want to illustrate with both of these is that we need removals in the future if we're going to achieve net zero. And we're going to need both technical ones, but also significantly uh, biogenic storage removals. So those nature-based ones. So in response to this picture, the European Union has been uh, developing, uh, I mean, it has developed a number of different climate policies. And so if we jump across to the next slide, uh, there's already quite a lot of policy covering carbon emissions. So there's the emissions trading scheme, which covers large emitters across multiple sectors within the EU. There's what's referred to as the effort sharing regulation, which covers um, the non-emissions trading scheme sector emissions. These include things like transport, buildings, and agriculture, most significantly. And the result of these policies is that broadly, we're starting to see emissions fall within the EU. However, on the removal side, there's a pretty significant gap. So there is the uh, specific regulation targeting land use, land use change and forestry uh, as a sector, which of course includes some targets for removals, but this is really just at the member state level. So it's at national level targets. Um, and there's a, a lack of incentives for individual action on removals with biogenic storage. So there's no uh, EU level incentives for, for planting forests, for example, or for storing carbon in soils. Uh, in a coordinated approach anyway. And, and there's a, a total lack of policy incentives really for removals with geologic storage. There's some small exceptions around the emissions trading scheme, but that's the general picture. Um, and alongside this EU policy context, we're seeing a growth of private voluntary carbon markets for removals. So that gap is being filled, um, but not by central policymakers. Um, and so to, to fill this gap, it's, I think, the kind of broad strokes picture of the removals of, of climate policy. To fill this gap, uh, the EU Commission, which is the executive arm of the European Union, has proposed this carbon removal certification framework. So this framework was proposed finally in, in December last year. And the objective was to Im increase carbon removals through certification. So the idea is that by improving and streamlining the certification of removals, uh, this will support the development of markets and other uses of these carbon removals. So the idea is that by increasing the trust and transparency and, and generally <clears throat> uh, simplifying the many different current proposals for how you would measure these removals and how you would uh, certify them from the private market, you can, um, can help to develop a market and, and increase the upscaling of removals. Uh, this EU carbon removals certification framework covers both these kind of nature-based, what we call biogenic carbon pools, also those technical ones, geologic carbon pools, and also carbon storage products. So it's quite broad in its scope of which removals it is targeting. <clears throat> 
Uh, one thing which is left quite open by the current policy is what these removals will be used for. So this policy really focuses on the supply of removals and is not discussing at all. It leaves it wide open intentionally uh, what these removals will be used for. So what, you know, once you've got these certified removals, what are we certifying them for? To what, to what policy end? Um, given that this has been left wide open and in the rest of the presentation today, we focus on what we consider the riskiest use of these removals, are these certified removals and that's offsets. Um, but what does this current EU carbon removals certification framework proposal contain? I mean, there's two main pillars to this policy. The first one is that it develops removals criteria. Um, so these are the different criteria against which removals will be assessed uh, and methods for that assessment. And there are four main removals criteria that they identify. These are the so-called quality criteria, uh, a nice acronym. Um, these are around quantification of removals, the additionality of removals, uh, long-term storage criteria, and sustainability criteria. And we're going to discuss those in turn uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the proposal also empowers the European Commission to develop removals methodologies. So, uh, yeah, how these how these criteria would actually be assessed in practice. So that's the main pillar of the policy. The second part is around governance. So it establishes rules for recognizing the compliance of removals with those quality criteria and for recognizing private and public certification schemes and generally for the kind of verification side of the policy. Um, just to note that the this is just a proposal at this point. So the European Commission has developed this and that proposal is currently being discussed by the EU legislative bodies. So the parliament and the EU Council of Ministers. Uh, and then independently of that, the European Commission has put together an expert group to start to this process of independently developing those methodologies. So this is still quite a live issue. Okay. So now turning to soils, I mean, this is the, the focus of our research project is on soil removals and climate friendly soil management. Um, within the EU, soils are currently a source of emissions. They're 64 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. But research shows, um, as done in the in this project, that that could switch across and they could be a net source of removals, um, equivalent to 16 to sort of 25% of annual EU agricultural emissions seems reasonable by 2050, uh, if everything works in our favor. So there is potential here. I mean, there is the equivalent to approximately two or 3% of the EU's current current emissions. And so you can imagine in 2050, once we crunch all of those other emissions down, this could be a really significant source of, uh, of removals. Um, what are we talking about specifically here? I mean, there's land use change measures. So things like agroforestry, but also management change through a Agronomic, agronomic, sorry, measures on croplands and on grasslands. So these are things like cover crops, grassland management, reduced soil compaction. Uh, we have a whole uh, report with fact sheets on on these different types of measures. <clears throat> um, so clearly there are a number of different types of actions that we would like to incentivize, and there is real potential in terms of mitigation there. However, soil carbon removers, removals pose a number of challenges for certification. Um, and we're going to go through these in depth in the next uh, couple of slides. Uh, and we've arranged them around these kind of quality criteria that the Commission has proposed in their framework proposal. The thing with uh, soil carbon removals is that they are tricky and costly to measure. Um, they can be quite difficult to assess the additionality of carbon removals. There is, of course, quite significant risks that these carbon removals that are stored in carbon will be reversed in the future. It's a question about whether they're are going to be long lasting. Uh, and finally, soils are really important for multiple societal objectives. So we can't just really narrowly focus on uh, on climate objectives alone. We also have to consider the other implications. I think that's an additional challenge here for the soil carbon removal side of things. Now, the carbon removal certification mechanism does try to address each of these challenges. But uh, as Anna's going to take us through, there are a number of issues. Uh, with the current proposal. So Anna, I think you can take over. Thanks, Hugh. Yeah, so let's go deeper into, this, into these four challenges that 
the, the, the Commission structures their proposal around. So first of all, quantification. Uh, it's crucial to get the quantification of soil related removals right in order to get a good estimate of how much carbon is removed from the atmosphere. So what carbon removal activities related to soils can actually deliver. But Hugh has already mentioned it, it's challenging to measure the carbon stored in soils. Firstly, because soils are highly heterogeneous. And secondly, because soil sampling is costly and also, yeah, methods are still under development. Also, it's challenging to model and estimate carbon sequestration because there are several uncertainties involved there. So soil sequestration is a slow process. Individual soil carbon data is limited and baseline setting needs to be done in a robust way. So it needs to represent a good estimate of business as usual and not um, yeah, set the wrong incentives there. Also accounting for leakage is tricky. So it's difficult to know and quantify to what extent carbon leakage will take place in response to mitigation activities. But while being challenging, robust quantification is really essential because overestimating soil carbon removals would undermine the effectiveness of um, a certification or a funding scheme. Money would go uh, into activities that don't actually deliver what was promised. And if certified removal units were usable for offsetting, so to compensate for emissions, then overestimating these removals could even undermine the environmental integrity of a funding mechanism because ultimately it would lead to higher emissions in the atmosphere than without the mechanism if these emissions were compensated, but uh, uh, in reality not compensated by removals that don't uh, that, that are less than than what 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 they they promise. In terms of quantification, the approach proposed for the for, for the European certification framework has several weaknesses. So yeah, I'll only briefly mention these, but happy to go into more detail during our discussion later on. So firstly, the proposal does not refer to the principle of conservativeness for estimating removals, which actually could be considered as a good practice that has been established at the voluntary carbon market already. The proposed methodology for setting baselines risks to dilute ambition, and also the proposal mixes carbon removals and emission reductions, which is a deviation from the definition of removals by the IPCC and can cause confusion. Then we turn to the next uh, challenge, which is additionality. So when certifying removal activities, it's important to make sure that these activities are additional so that they are caused by the funding instrument and that they would not have occurred otherwise to set um, an ambitious incentive scheme. But ensuring additionality is challenging because you need to prove the counterfactual. So what would have happened in the absence of the incentive that has been created? Also, there are various existing policies and incentives that need to be taken into account, like, for example, the EU common agriculture policy. And we have many stakeholders and factors that are operating in the land sector. So it's a it's a complex sector. But again, if additionality cannot be ensured, this, was, this would undermine the effectiveness of the funding mechanism or even the integrity of the scheme if the certificates would be, were usable for offsetting. And also in this regard, the Commission's proposal has weaknesses. For example, it proposes to use standardized baselines and that relate to standard performance of comparable activities. And this implies a risk of a systematic selection bias. So potentially allowing removals to be certified that are not additional and therefore not ambitious. Um, and that's because operators with a true baseline that outperforms these, this standardized baseline and the, these operators would generate non-additional removals, they have a strong incentive to join the program because they don't face any implementation costs, but would still be rewarded with certificates. Uh, yes, and secondly, there may be individual additionality assessments according to the Commission's proposal, but here the details are still lacking. Then the third criterion that's mentioned in the Commission's proposal is permanence or rather non-permanence, which is the challenge we uh, talk about here. So um, non-permanence refers to 
uh, a scenario where emission re emission reductions or removals that are generated by a mitigation activity are reversed at a later point in time relative to the baseline scenario. And miti particularly mitigation activities that enhance or preserve natural carbon reservoirs can be reversed because they are subject to natural disturbances or human interference. Humans might change their minds how they want to manage specific land. And for soils, we see specific challenges, for example, through tenure rights and a reluctance by farmers to pass on burdens to future generations. Mm. So long-term carbon storage in soils can just not be guaranteed. Um, yeah, and mitigation activities would need to be permanently sustained to preserve sock stocks. Non-permanence also undermines the effectiveness of funding or the integrity of a funding mechanism if the certificates were usable for offsetting, because emissions that remain in the atmosphere for centuries can just not be balanced out by shorter term removals. And also here, the proposed, proposed approach by the European Commission has weaknesses, because according to the proposal, there is no obligation to ensure long term storage. There's, this is not precisely defined. For soil carbon removals, the Commission proposes to issue temporary certificates, but there's no mechanism for replacing expired certificates, and that's particularly risky if those certificates were usable for offsetting. The liability mechanisms that are proposed for carbon farming have their pitfalls. So, for example, buffer pools could be used, but they have shown or they could potentially not be sufficient to compensate for large scale reversals. And according to the Commission's proposal, it could also be possible to certify activities that store carbon only for very short periods of time. So for a couple of years, for example, and that uh, goes a bit, runs a bit contrary to the whole idea of this framework. And then lastly, sustainability. So it's important to ensure that climate friendly soil management positively affects other social and environmental objectives as Hugh has already outlined, um, because these actions have broader impact, so they cannot only deliver mitigation results, but also contribute to adaptation to biodiversity, to better water quality, or provide other sources of income to farmers. And not accounting for environmental and social impacts risks to cause environmental and social harm and misses the chance to realize wider positive impacts by removal action. And also here we see some weaknesses of the approach proposed by the Commission because the proposed sustainability criteria remain vague and they have no regulatory effect. And there is no requirement for a net positive sustainability impact. So here we see the need for a higher level of ambition. Also social impacts and human health are not explicitly mentioned. And also, for example, toxic effects are missing in the criteria. And lastly, um, the, there's no requirement for quantitative monitoring of impacts and no um, requirement for stakeholder involvement. So to conclude, um, I think, yeah, from our, from our analysis of these challenges related to funding soil carbon removal activities, we think that any kind of removal certificate from soil carbon storage should not be usable for offsetting because the risks for env environmental integrity are too high. And for the European certification framework, the possible uses of the certificates still need to be clarified. So at the moment, offsetting is not explicitly excluded. And in our view, this is a problem. Then what will be better approaches to promote carbon friendly soil management than carbon crediting? So here we would like to share some first thoughts with you, but we're still working on more detailed proposals and are also would also be happy to hear your feedback or your views on this. So firstly, funding for nature is needed in any case. So we need financial support to good practices by farmers that deliver multiple environmental, social and economic benefits. Um, yeah, and that money is needed. We think action-based payments could work as incentives to farmers 
while results-based payments could be used for contribution claims. So those who make the payment can claim that they made a financial contribution to climate mitigation, but they would not uh, be able to account underlying removals or emission reductions towards their own mitigation targets. So there would not be any compensation or offsetting. Uh, another important point to consider would be to strengthen regulation, to, so to prohibit or tax unsustainable practices gradually. And the certificates that this um, carbon removal certification framework in the EU would issue could work as labels for high quality removals. So for example, they could be used as criteria to disperse subsidies. While this would be under the condition that the criteria in the existing um, proposal by the Commission would be strengthened. Yeah, we're interested to hear other views. Um, what, what are experiences from other countries with funding or crediting carbon farming? That would be very interesting to hear. And with that, thanks for your attention. And yeah, we're happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Anna and Hugh. So uh, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna seed this with a couple of initial questions, and then we'll go to uh, uh, to questions from uh, from the audience. Um, initial question to Hugh: uh, You you indicate, uh, I think, quite correctly in the in the report that uh, uh, assessing sequestration in soils is difficult. Uh, sampling is is an extremely e expensive uh, enterprise. Uh, we have alternatives, including uh, modeling. Uh, do you think that those alternative approaches uh, would ever have the the level of integrity that you'd be uh, confident enough to to utilize them instead of uh, instead of actual on the ground sampling? Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, I mean, I think. As Anna mentioned, this, there are some clear challenges to soil carbon, not around the heterogeneity of soils and the kind of variability of impact of these different actions on different soils or within different contexts, and just the slow sequestration rates. I mean, sometimes it just takes five years for these things to show up, right? Um, I think another thing to kind of keep in mind is you've always got this accuracy versus cost trade-off. So for certification to make sense, <clears throat> we can't have these transaction costs of MRV being higher being too high because it's going to act as a significant barrier to farmers um jumping in and, and getting certified so it's not just that it needs to be accurate it also needs to be relatively low cost and so i think modeling has to be the way that we're heading towards in the future but um i think here it's really important also to think about the, the accuracy that we require depends a little bit on the use of the of the credits so if we're going to be using these soil carbon removal certificates to offset emissions reductions, then I think we need to be pretty certain about the quantification, you know, because we can be pretty certain about the emissions, you know, it's, it's, we have more experience, I think, with estimating the actual emissions that are occurring, so we can be quite certain there. And um, so if we're going to start offsetting those with uncertain removals, I think that that's a concern. But of course, if we're uh, using these certified removals for a different use, for example, for targeting public sector um, subsidies, then I think we can accept Quite a lot higher uncertainty. I mean, at the moment in the EU, we distribute huge amounts of money through the common agricultural policy without having any real idea about what the climate impact is going to be. So even kind of marginal increases in the um, in the accuracy of our targeting of that sort of funding, I think there we could accept um, yeah, modeling probably pretty soon. Um, but it, yeah, as it currently stands, I, I, don't, I wouldn't be accepting modeling alone without, um, without monitoring. Uh, because I just don't think the accuracy is there enough. And I think also just my understanding from reading the literature is that there's also a concern that we don't know what's happening at all levels of the soil carbons, uh, so, soil carbon as well. So we have, maybe have some confidence about what's going on on the top 30 centimeters of soil, but the deeper soil, we don't, scientists just aren't confident exactly what the, uh, the impacts are there. So I think there are some uncertainties and we shouldn't just be rushing headlong into this um, and just using modeling based on on, on current practices, because I just don't think that at the moment that's sufficient. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Uh, next question for Anna. So uh, one of the things that the report indicates is that uh, some other systems, including uh, the the uh, the CDM under Kyoto, used a more uh, conservative standard in terms of a, assessment of removals. Uh, could you 
uh, suggest what are some examples of how we might utilize uh, a, a, mo a more conservative approach in terms of our assessment of, of uh, soil carbon removal? Yeah, thanks. Um, so conservative in terms of quantification, I think um, under the CDM, we had the practice that um, removals had to be estimated in a conservative way, which means that they should not be overestimated with a probability of 90%. And I think this is a principle that could be taken over here. Also, I think um, regarding baseline setting, it is really crucial to ensure that baselines go beyond business as usual. So they must be uh, higher than the standard good agricultural practices that are currently already employed. That would be a, that would contribute to a conservative approach. Uh, also, I think baselines must consider existing policies and measures and take policy making like development of developing new policies into account. So to ensure additionality. Uh, and also we saw in the past that perverse incentives were provided. So you could uh, deplete soils first and then get a lot of certificates later. So that also would need to be uh, ensured that this does not happen. And then, yeah, leakage needs to be accounted for. And yeah, I guess those are the main points I would make. Okay, thanks for that. And another aspect of the report uh, emphasizes the fact that uh, that soil carbon sequestration can be relatively uh, evanescent and non-permanent compared to some other approaches, uh, and and that's a concern. Would uh, would you be okay with a, with a requirement that a purchaser of uh, of carbon credits also makes a commitment to subsequently purchase uh, a, a, a something that was more uh, long term, uh, and that would be uh, a, a legal requirement in terms of the initial purchase? Would that uh, solve the concerns that uh, uh, that you're addressing, Anna? Yeah, I think my first answer would be they sh they better shouldn't be used for offsetting at all, no matter if they are labeled as temporary credits or not. Um, I think temporary crediting is an option to address this risk of non-permanence, and it's also mentioned by the European Commission in their proposal for carbon farming as well as for carbon stored in products, which is another type of removal that is, in is covered by this uh, certification framework. Um, so yes, it could be an option if offsetting was allowed in the end, it could be an option to require buyers to purchase credits from more permanent activities to once these temporary credits expire. But this would need to be defined. So who is responsible for replacing these units would need to be defined and then also monitored. And one problem I see is that if buyers were responsible to replace temporary credits, this could make such credits less attractive compared to permanent certificates, while at the same time, the funding for nature restoration is urgently needed. So, and that is a link, I think, to the co-benefits, the social and environmental benefits that soil carbon sequestration can deliver, because these co-benefits really set the these non-permanent removals Apart from geological storage, they deliver more than mitigation. And I think this, if this was clearly communicated and and labeled accordingly, that would be a benefit and could avoid focus of funding only to these per, more, more permanent storage option. So yeah, and I think differentiate differentiating temporary from permanent certificates would is is crucial, like to really make clear that. They have they they differ in terms of long term storage, but they also deliver they also differ in terms of the co benefits that they can deliver. If I can maybe jump in there too, I mean yeah. I I think also um, sometimes these discussions make it look like either we do certification of soil carbon removals or we do nothing at all. But in reality, we've got lots of other different policy options which we can which we can use to promote soil carbon removals. And I mean that's. I mean, I think one of the messages we want to convey is that soil carbon removals do offer lots of potential. They offer all of these co-benefits. They also offer some mitigation 
um, and they need to be promoted. And the question here is whether certification is the right way to do it or whether we're heading down the wrong path and whether other options will be more effective and at, at promoting them. Yeah. yeah. Given those, given those pretty compelling co-benefits of uh, of uh, of uh, developing soil carbon sequestration, are are we indulging a fiction that if we don't provide it through, you know, these kind of markets, right, that that funding just simply won't flow and we'll lose real opportunities in terms of uh, in terms of protecting soils? Is it worth the trade-offs of some of the uncertainties that we might have in terms of sequestration to get that infusion of funding or, or are you fairly confident that we can uh, that the European Union will from a political standpoint fund uh, soil protection because of those other benefits because that's one of the things I worry about uh, here also in the United States I, mean, I can never go I mean I I mean Europe already has the common agricultural policy this enormous 50 billion dollars a year plus of, of money which is going directly to to farmers so there are already much bigger pots of money which could be directed towards this objective i mean just in comparison i think the voluntary carbon market is what two billion dollars a year or something so we're talking orders of mag an order of magnitude more um so i think on some level this i i kind of have a contrasting fear which is that this focus on certification is going to be a distraction away from the areas where we could be having more significant impact but I, but I take your point about, um, I mean, I think initially I was really attracted to these certification approaches because it's really difficult to find funding for biodiversity, just generally. No? So I, th I think it is really important to keep that biodiversity target in mind. And, and I think recognizing also that there is a growth in voluntary carbon markets already. So people do want to pay for these sorts of things. So I think a two-pronged approach, one is making sure that we're getting the most out of that market as possible, whilst at the same time, keeping our attention and focus on on where the real gains can be had and avoiding the kind of risky side effects that we might have of establishing this um yeah the certification approach through the eu for things like soil carbon removals okay thanks for that all right we're going to turn to uh to audience questions for which there is an abundance and as as always i'll apologize if we if we don't get to all of them uh first question is is there an agreed definition of of long-term storage No, I think there isn't. <laughs> I think um, there is a like a standard practice that has established on the voluntary carbon market, which uh, is a hundred years. That seems to be a good time frame for, or a, a, a still manageable time frame for ensuring um, storage. But that's still not enough in order to. Uh, make up for emissions that stay in the atmosphere for centuries so um yeah this and also i think for soils 100 years could be quite ambitious because uh for, for so for forests it seems feasible while also challenging but for soils it can be even more challenging because of these tenure rights and of yeah shorter management cycles i think where decisions might change um we are also yeah, we are still in the beginning of thinking about what appropriate minimum uh, storage requirements would be for different types of activities, whether it would make sense to set such minimum time periods. I think the longer the better, that's always the case. Um, but but yeah, I, I still, I'm still starting to get a feeling for what is manageable also for farmers, like what, what would they accept? What, 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 what seems like something that uh, does not set too high barriers to participate in such an incentive mechanism. Okay, anything to add on that, Hugh? Okay, um, next question. Uh, what are the key environmental and social metrics used in uh, soil storage uh, decision-making and, and evaluation? I guess you touched a bit upon that in terms of sustainability criteria. So maybe if you could expand on that. Sure. I mean, we, in, an, in some other work, we had a look at existing soil carbon removal certification methodologies. So from the voluntary carbon market and some publicly funded ones. And that was our question was, what are they already doing to promote the sustainability and, and how are they doing that? And I think the kind of key takeaway there was that they're not 
it's not front and center in these voluntary carbon markets. No, they're really focused on the climate mitigation output. Um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, we've probably mentioned some of the key ones already, but I think soil, soils and land use impact, um, I mean, mitigation, obviously, but climate adaptation is really key. Water quality and quantity, I think, are really affected by these same decisions. So they need to be front and center, and of course, biodiversity. And then the social side of thing, I think, is really important. No? So it has to be um, something which benefits uh, farmers and the communities that they're in as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, uh, as you can imagine, there's uh, there's plenty of questions associated with uh, the bugaboo of additionality. Uh, so this is uh, the first. Um, uh, what is your view on the criteria for additionality? It seems that the commission is focused on legal and financial additionality, but not physical additionality. Seems to imply that the certificates will be used purely for per ton incentives rather than to verify that CO2 is being physically and permanently removed. I, I think I've never heard the term physical additionality. I, I, I'm not entirely sure what, what's meant by that. Um, yeah, but I think even in terms of regu regulatory additionality, the the standard that the proposal sets are not high enough because, as I said, the standardized baseline um, th that refers to a standard practice is is not ambitious. It it refers to what what's already being done. Uh, as a general practice, and not what what would be needed as the um, yeah a, a, as a as an ambitious benchmark. Maybe Hugh, mm -hmm. do you have any? I mean, I, yeah, I think we're quite critical in the paper, no, on on how they're defining additionality. I mean, I think the risk with soil carbon, particularly, is that you've got this. You know, different soils have different levels of soil carbon, and you've got kind of a a spread of uncertainty around what is going to be estimated within there, and um this use of the standardized baselines combined with that variability, I think is really tricky because there's a potential for lots of people who just happen to be on the right side of that distribution curve to look like they're doing removals or to be credited for removals. Um, and given it's a voluntary scheme, that's not going to be offset by all these people who happen to be on the wrong side of that um, distribution curve. Yeah, so I think that raises some real concerns for additionality. Yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, it, it, uh, where do you base your overly negative attitude towards biochar use as as carbon removal activity? And they they indicate that you may have overlooked some major studies, and they cite IPCC and some other uh, uh, studies associated with biochar. Where do you come down on on the on the role of biochar in terms of uh, EU policymaking? Yeah, I think that's a hot potato. To say that right. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I also try to study the literature. I think it's not conclusive. It's it's, it's not uh, entirely clear to me to what extent we can recommend it. I think the main problem is that we will lack uh, large amounts of, uh, of excess biomass that we can use to produce biochar. And I've heard about... Um, uh, about projects where they where they use, I'm lacking the English word. What comes out of like water cleaning uh, the the process of cleaning the water? Like the you, what's the word? Uh, Can't help. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they use they use, they use uh, that fluid. To, to sludge. Sludge, sludge. Right. Sludge. Burn that sludge and and turn that into biochar. But that has the risk to to uh, introduce like toxic components into into soils. So I I think that wouldn't be a good idea. And also, from what I read, I think it's not clear what biochar does to the micro the microbiotic balance in soils. Uh, it I think the the studies that have been the, the experiments that are available are mostly short term, so we don't have long term evidence of the impacts yet. Um, and yeah, I think there is a risk that it could cause harm to biodiversity. So I would make a pledge for a precautionary principle here. Okay. 
Anything to add there, Hugh? No, I mean, I'd, I'd agree. I mean, I think we, our colleagues, Anna, um, Freddie Lassen, did one of the reports, which I'll, I'll put the link somewhere, uh, which assesses each of these different types of um, removal actions. And that was the conclusion they came to, so. Okay, all right, thanks for that. Uh, next question, uh, does the proposal consider insetting uh, credits within a supply chain or scope three uh, versus uh, offsetting? I mean, the proposal really doesn't focus on the use of the credits, so it leaves this wide open. So they, they mention it, there's a line saying, you know, certified carbon removals could be used for offsets, they could be used for insetting, they could be used for prioritizing public funding. Uh, my understanding is that there might be some expectation that if the carbon removal certification mechanism came up with these criteria and methodologies for for removals, that those methodologies could then be picked up and used in an insetting context as well. Uh, but it's not explicitly um, it's not explicitly a focus. Mm -hmm. You think it would make sense to, for for there to be more uh, emphasis in terms of those potential benefits? Um, I mean, I, I think insetting, um, what would I say? I, I mean, I have one concern with insetting and that's around the transparency side of things. So I think, um, I think if you have a approved certified methodology like this one that's being proposed through the carbon removal certification framework, then that there starts to get around some of those transparency concerns that you might have with insetting. Uh, but again, I think all of our same critiques about whether a about whether this should be used, you know, soil carbon removals should be used for offsetting, also apply to insetting. So, if a um, if a corporate is is not reducing their own emissions and instead is is um, relying on soil carbon removals, we, then we face all of the same problems that Anna identified in those last couple of slides. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. And uh, next question. Uh, in relation to the sustainability uh, criteria that you outlined, uh, couldn't this be interpreted as the EU pushing for a focus on co-benefits being taken into account, uh, but they can't be uh, the reason for taking on the removal activity because then it, it wouldn't count as additional? Um, I need to think that one through. Uh... I think whether an action is additional or not depends on whether it is caused by the policy or by the certification framework. No, so it's did the certification framework lead to this activity happening? If so, you can say, yeah, that's additional. So I think even if um, even if they've also included all these criteria for co-benefits, that that wouldn't mean that the action itself wasn't an additional one, and then the removals associated with it would be additional. That would be my first response, I think. Anything to add on that, Ellen? Yeah, I think they these two issues need to be considered separately. We need to ensure additionality and we need to ensure these core benefits. And I think um, there there is plenty of room for for additional mitigation activity that still causes core benefits. And and what we said is like the EU is actually not prioritizing these core benefits. This would be something we would be uh arguing for that that the, the focus on on these core benefits becomes stronger so the, the criteria as they are formulated at the moment don't really push for any focus on sustainability mm -hmm. in my interpretation yeah i mean i think it's important to i mean just thinking there's an illustrative example i'm from new zealand and in new zealand obviously there's the emissions trading scheme which rewards afforestation and there's been a policy push towards afforestation and exotic pine forest because it grows really fast sucks carbon out which is great but the flip side of that is that there are no biodiversity co-benefits and it's also unpopular with farmers who don't want to see their land turned into some ugly plantation forestry and then also has all these other negative co-benefits like there's been flooding recently which is in part due to the change in land use and also is associated with all of the offcuts from the plantation forestry being washed down to beaches and things so i think that's an example of where good intentions around climate mitigation um, have resulted in a policy which isn't actually benefiting society. And, and that's why it's really, I think, crucial to focus on those co-benefits as you're designing the policy to avoid those sorts of worst case scenarios. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a follow-up question on that. I, I, I understand wanting to assess and avoid 
uh, negative uh, impacts in terms of sustainability for these policies. But would you go so far as to mandate uh, that uh, you have to uh, prove sustainability co-benefits in order to obtain uh, credits in this system? Do you think that should be necessary? I mean, I think one way of dealing with it is to um, is to start with the actions that you're implementing. So if the action looks like it's going to be uh, risky in terms of biodiversity impacts, then you would set higher standards for those sorts of actions. So if we're thinking biochar has come up already, if if you really want to do biochar, maybe we would say, okay, you can do biochar, but you're going to have to do pretty intensive co-benefit monitoring. You can have to monitor the impacts on biodiversity. So you could set a potentially a differentiated standard for those sorts of actions that are a bit riskier. Um, whereas there are lots of actions that, which I think, you know, I mean, carbon farming can deliver on lots of different fronts on terms of water quality and quantity and on biodiversity. And so those sorts of actions, I think we could probably be a bit more confident that they're going to be delivering on those multiple fronts and those ones wouldn't require the same sorts of monitoring. But we haven't actually discussed this, so I'd be interested to see what Anna thinks as well. What do you think, Anna? We'll put you on the spot there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, in my view, yes, I think operators should be required to demonstrate positive sustainability impacts. I really think we need to set the bar high here. And I think there are too many bad examples from the past where projects had negative, uh, negative impacts on local populations and on biodiversity. And I, uh, I think the risks for these standards being diluted in practice and in the policy process are there in any case. So setting the ambition high up front and yeah really requiring these positive impacts would be a good thing yeah and i mean i think the um the discussion around these sorts of policies is often around systemic change no and I, I think that systemic change is what we should be aiming for but that also means that you're changing systems and that that has big potentially broad wide scale impacts so i think it's not enough just to be focusing on the, the medication side okay all right. Next question. Uh, do you think competition for quality in carbon removals will drive companies to go above and beyond the quite simplistic uh, EU framework? Can you repeat competition by who? Oh, uh, do you think competition? I mean, this is a, I think this is an argument being made by the questioner. Do you think competition for quality in carbon removals will drive companies to go above and beyond the quite simplistic EU framework. I think they're arguing that the market will will sort this out. I mean, I, I could have a go. I mean, I think that that's one of the motivations for this policy, which on the commission side is that they're worried about the opposite happening, that there'd be this race mm -hmm. to the bottom, or that there has been or is a race to the bottom. And I think the incentives are there. No, if you lower the cost for the operator, for the farmer, you're more likely to get farmers signing up to your system. Um, and if you lower the cost for the buyer, you're also of more likely to get buyers choosing your removal credit rather than another one. So I would be worried about the opposite being the case, that it's a race to the bottom. And that's where the certification framework comes in, is that it's trying to set a bottom, a bottom floor of quality. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next question. Do the presenters think any of the existing mechanisms for addressing uh, the durability of, uh, of non-permanent storage, such as buffer pools or reliability for replacement, uh, offers a workable precedent? Um, how could these approaches to mitigating non-permanence address the risk that replacement liabilities might be uh, discharged in bankruptcy? Yeah, we've looked into a lot of these approaches that exist on the voluntary carbon market in as part of the carbon credit quality initiative, which Eco Institute is part of. And I think um, in theory, there could be good approaches through these uh, through through these mechanisms. So if you had liability by the project proponent and additional in assurance insurances, and then um, a well-established buffer pool that's uh, that's sufficiently capitalized and that also ensures that reversals can be addressed after the monitoring period, for example, by canceling the credits that are in the buffer after the monitoring period. Uh, yeah, the, the, the period for which it is compulsory to, to monitor and compensate for reversals. All these things can help, but in practice, we don't see any 
crediting standard where we we think that all risks are sufficiently addressed in this ev evaluation we do in the carbon credit quality initiative. Um, and for soils, I think, yeah, the risks are just too high for offsetting, as I said before. Um, I think these approaches mitigate the risk to some extent, but they can never guarantee permanence. And and are you concerned about this this question of 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 even if you impose a liability mechanism, it being discharged in in bankruptcy ultimately? Yeah, bankruptcy is an issue. For example, yeah. So what what would happen then? Then some other institution would need to take over liability. Um, but but also large scale reversals, like if we have like natural disturbances at larger scale, which we might see in the future with uh, with climate change advancing more and more then the question is yeah will these will these mechanisms be able to suffice and I have doubts there okay uh, next question it, it sounds like the EU framework is below the standards currently being set by verification bodies such as uh, uh, Vera and Silvera they'll be an interesting thing to flag for you if you think that's true. Um, are the certification schemes mutually exclusive, or could one use another standard body that goes beyond uh, EU guidelines? Um, does that refer to the to to how like programs will be able to operate under the framework? Um, uh, it. Well, I don't want to interpret the question too much, but the initial part was that uh, that uh, that the questioner was wondering if the if some of the voluntary standards, such as Vera's, for example, uh, set standards that are that are higher than what the EU is contemplating. And then the second part was: Are the certification schemes mutually exclusive, or could one use another standard body that goes beyond EU guidelines? I mean, on the on the second part, uh, I think the hope is that the carbon removal certification framework sets a standard which is which is high. No, I, I mean, and our review sort of says that at the moment it's not it's not high enough for soil carbon removals. Uh, what the the current proposal doesn't do is talk about uses. So um, people could turn to other certification schemes depending on their use if they wanted to, and then and the same with the with the commission one. So they're not mutually exclusive. I wouldn't say. Um, yeah. Now go for it. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I interpret the question too much, but I think so. So the the proposal um, foresees certification schemes that need to be recognized by the Commission, and they uh, and uh, and I think like it could end up being a similar system like the COSIA system. So. Uh, crediting programs can apply for recognition under the carbon removal certification framework. I think this would be a construct that how it could look like in practice. Um, and I think regarding the, the, the first part of the question, do existing standards go beyond or programs go beyond the standards that are proposed by the European Commission? Um, I think some standards go beyond what the Commission proposes in some aspects. I think there is no program out there on the voluntary carbon markets that sets high benchmarks for all of these criteria. Um, but for some, so for example, the gold standard, I think, sets higher standards on sustain with regard to sustainability than the Euro European Commission does, for example. And there are other programs that do better in ensuring additionality than the current EU proposal does. Okay. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Um, can you share more about the uncertainties or current understandings about soil carbon gains or losses in deeper soils uh, uh, in terms of uh, soil conservation uh, practices? Uh, it says there may be some practices that increase soil carbon in surface soil because losses in in deeper soil. Uh, uh, where uh, do those uh, deep soil carbon losses end up? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't provide any more detail than the question does. I mean, unfortunately, our colleague Anna Freely Larson um, led the work on the specific impacts of the different soil carbon practices. But yeah, my understanding, um, which we've taken to this report, is just that there are uncertainties in quantification and that the quantification approaches and criteria established in the framework are not sufficient to, to deal with those uncertainties. But yeah, I'm sorry, I can't give a more specific answer there. Yeah, anything to add, Anna? I'm not a soil scientist either, unfortunately. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a big question with no-till agriculture, right? Where some, yeah. some argue, right, there's benefits from zero to 20 centimeters and then uh, you, you might get net losses below that, right? It's an interesting question. So we'll, we'll leave it there. And we are, we are now at the, uh, at the top of the hour. Um, I really want to thank uh, Anna and Hugh for uh, raising some, you know, ongoing sort of questions, right, that we're all going to have to uh, engage with as we try to figure out what is a, 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 is a, a viable portfolio of, of carbon removal responses, right? And the uh, European Union, I think, is doing us uh, a, a mighty benefit in terms of at least uh, establishing a structure for this discussion. But uh, I think your report emphasizes uh, the need uh, to really fortify uh, some of these uh, uh, standards. So I appreciate your insights. I appreciate the insights of uh, of our audience who who joined us. And uh, I hope uh, that you will join us in a couple of weeks for uh, for the next uh, uh, episode of, of the webinar. So thank you, everyone, and have a uh, great rest of the day. Goodbye now. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah, thank